Okay, so what I want you to do with me right now is picture something with me. Picture in your hand you are holding a, a kernel of corn. Okay, you got it in your hand there. It's not a trick question. You, you're holding this kernel of, of corn. I want to ask you, do you see it there? Okay, it, it's there in the palm of your hand. I want to ask you this question. How did that kernel of corn get there? I'm not talking about how did it get into your hand. How, how did that kernel of corn come about? Well, before there was this kernel of corn in your palm, there was another kernel of corn somewhere else. And it was dead. But it was planted in the ground, and beyond anything that we're able to even understand or think about, it started to grow. And as it grew, it reached up to the sun. And as it, as it reached to the sun, it began to mature. And as it matured, it bore fruit. That's how that kernel got into the palm of your hand. You could say that this life of this little kernel had, a, had stages, right? There was a stage when it was dead, it came alive, and it grew, well, in a similar way, we can say the same thing about the Christian life. Our Christian lives have stages to them. And uh, just jumping right into this text today, we're, we're not in Romans, just going to take a little break this week from Romans. We're going to be in the book of Acts chapter 9. But using the Apostle Paul, or Saul as he was known before he became an apostle, as our case study, we're going to see how the, the Christian life falls out or unfolds in three stages. Everybody with me? Three stages of the Christian life. Stage number one is this. In the believer's life, pre-conversion. Pre-conversion. As we've been talking about, I mean, ad nauseum now for the past month or so, we've seen uh, in excruciating details in the book of Romans, that man is not born sort of neutral, right? We're, we're, we're not, we don't come into this world neutral and we have the forces of evil and the forces of good that are vying for our allegiance, for our heart. That is not what happens. The Bible says that we are born in sin. Romans 3.10 that we looked at last week says this, that there are none righteous, no, not one. No one is born righteous. The Bible says there is none who understands God. There is none who seek after God. And I've told you several times, if you don't believe that's true, uh, we never have to sit our three-year-olds down and teach them how to sin, do we? Have you ever sat your three-year-old child down and said, uh, today, son, I'm going to teach you how to covet something that is not yours? No, that's just inbred in us. And if you don't believe that's true, go sign up and watch the nursery one time. You don't teach children how to covet or argue or steal or whatever it might be. Well, we first meet the Apostle Paul. He's previously called Saul in Acts chapter 7. And he's there, an accomplice to murder. So it's Acts chapter 7, uh, the, the last part of Acts 7, and then a couple of verses in chapter 8, and then a few verses in chapter 9 is sort of the, the we're gonna, we'll look at today as the pre-conversion life of Paul. So I just want to read from that. Uh, Acts, we're, we're, so you'll see it on the screen. Uh, and this is a kind of a compilation of some verses, the ones I just told you about. It says, then they cast him, they, they're speaking of Stephen, the Christian uh, man who was following Jesus in the early church. They cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. 
But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, or Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So early on, Saul has blood on his hands. He was there when Stephen was martyred. He was a Jewish, Jewish zealot. He was determined to rid Israel of Christianity. It wasn't called Christianity at the time, but he was determined to rid Israel against this insidious sect of people who dared follow this, uh, this rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth. He was, up, he was shaking up the religious establishment. And y'all, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed at all. Nominal Christians, those by name, always get agitated when genuine believers follow Christ and start acting boldly for Christ. Well, if anyone ever had a ticket to heaven, a right standing with God, it was Saul of Tarsus. According to his own words in Philippians, Saul, he's, he's describing himself how he was. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul would say, concerning the law, a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. In other words, Paul is saying, I had every advantage that anyone born on this earth should have or could have had to have favor with God. I studied, he would say, under the Jewish rabbi Gamaliel. All of that on the outside, and yet Paul was lost. He was imprisoned by his sin. This was Paul's pre-conversion life. He had an outward fervency for God, but inwardly he was decayed. There are many things in our lives that are unique to us, as they certainly were to Paul. But each one of us is exactly like Paul in that we are born in a state of lostness. A state of lostness. I don't mean California. It could be. But here's the deal. Some of us grew up in Christian homes where we heard from, from early on the name of Jesus. We heard about sin and we, we heard the, the story of the gospel. And that's good. That's a very good thing. But you were not always a follower of Christ. Other of us, others of us here as young people, we never darken the doors of a church. But re be reminded and understand, folks, each one of us here today was born at enmity with God. That's what the Bible says. We were not born neutral. We were not born with an inclination to run to God. We were born as enemies with or, or of God. We're all born consumed with ourselves. Listen, none of us was born a Christian. You understand that? Not one of us here today was born a Christian. Martin Luther wrote that we are born in carvatus in se. In carvatus in se. We were bent in or we are curved in on ourselves. He wrote, man is curved in on himself and bends physical and spiritual goods towards himself, seeking himself in all things. That's who we are, y'all. We are born as selfish people. We might not be blatant about it, but the world revolves around me, myself, and I. And you know it's true. My mom reminded me of this just this past week. Of how selfish I was as a child. I don't like to make these stories about me, especially if it makes me in a good light, uh, which is infrequent. But I have to tell you this. I was in the fourth grade playing flag football. And up until that time, um, it was the last game of the year. And until that time, 
I had scored every touchdown that my team had scored for the entire year. Every, every week in the newspaper, they would put the, a running tally of who ha has how many points, you know, over, over all the, like, seven or eight teams. And my name was always at the top, and it was always at the top by, like, double the second-place guy. I scored a lot of touchdowns. Got to be the last game. We're winning. I never will forget this. And our coach, Russell Rawlings, called an end-around. You know what an end-around is? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Uh, and end around is a is sort of a fake play, and I was quarterback, right? And so the way the end around works is you, you the quarterback or who the running back is always running around the end, you know, and it, and everybody gets accustomed to chasing after the guy running around the end. Well, the end around is the quarterback takes the ball and he runs like he's going to run around the end, and the end goes in the opposite direction, and the quarterback throws the ball, hands off to that end, and he goes uh, counter to where everyone else is going. And so all the motion is going that way, and the guy with the ball runs that way. That's the way it's drawn up. This play was drawn up for Bobby Watson. And I get the ball, and I run around the end, and I hand it off to Bobby Watson, and the whole team, my team, the other team, follows me like a, you know, uh, what a bear after honey. They're just on me. They, they have no idea Bobby Watson has the ball. And he's streaking down the sideline. No one within 100 miles of him. He's going to score a touchdown. And, and I start running after him. because you know, I'm just excited. I'm running after Bobby. And I'm running after Bobby. And in my mind, as a fourth grader, I'm going, oh, no. Somebody other than me on my team is going to score a touchdown. This all happened in a in a you know just a flash of a second. I don't remember it all, but but I remember him scoring a touchdown. And you know what I did? I did not celebrate. You know what I did? Anybody want to guess what I did? Pouted? No, I did much worse than pouted. I took, I took my, no, I didn't just cry. No, no, I took that internal thing that was going on, that messed up heart, that, that blackened heart, right? I took it and expressed it outwardly by running up to the referee and saying, he stepped out of bounds. <laughs> you know, and we can laugh at that, and I can laugh at that. But y'all, we're, we're not as blatant as that. But that's what our hearts are like. We, as in curvatus in se, curved in on ourselves. We can fake it. We can do outward acts of what we think are good. But y'all, the Bible says this, that each of us is born dead in our sin. And without a transforming work of God in our hearts, we can do all the religious activity we ever want to do and think that we can look good on the outside. And we might very well look good on the outside. We might be a preacher. We might sing in the choir. We might play the piano. We might be a deacon or an elder or whatever it might be. But unless our hearts have been changed before God, we are hopeless, miserable nothings. And that's who Paul was. As we've seen, he was chasing down God's people. He was chasing down the church all the time thinking he was doing something good. Well, stage two in the believer's life is salvation. Salvation. That's the act of being saved. Not Listen, you're not being saved from the devil. Understand that. Salvation is about being saved. Anybody want to take a... Guess what I'm going to say? Huh? Partly. Y'all, salvation means we are saved from the wrath of a holy God. Acts 9, verses 3 through 19, kind of a long section, but let me just read this. It says, Now as he went his way, again, we're talking about Saul, as, we, uh, as he went his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone all around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? 
And he said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you're to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much evil he's done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed. He entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. So here we see Saul of Tarsus, this great defender of Israel, on his way to Damascus. And why is he going to Damascus? He's going to round up any of these followers of this Jesus of Nazareth that he can get his hands on and take them back to Jerusalem and throw them into prison or worse. But notice what happens here. God comes to Saul. God makes the first move. Saul wasn't on his way to Damascus just raising his hands to the Lord and going, Oh Lord, search my heart and know me. Try my thoughts and see if there's any evil way within me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is not what he was doing. Paul said he was a Pharisee of, a, of Pharisees. Paul is on his way to Damascus essentially thinking, Oh God, how great I am, and you see how wonderful a person I am, how religious I am, look what I am doing for you. Well, Saul is blinded, he's taken to Damascus for three days. His eyes, though, are eventually open. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. In short, he is saved. And then notice what happens. Then he gets baptized. And the rest is, as they say, history. Y'all, Paul's exact circumstances were unlike anything that we'll experience. As a believer, you should not think that God's going to come to you and shine a, bl- a bright light on you or that you're going to hear God's voice from heaven. It doesn't happen that way anymore. Paul, Paul would say as, a, as one born outside of time that God, the Lord Jesus, appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus to authenticate, to commission him as an apostle with the capital A. We're all small apostles with the little letter A, but none of us are filling the role of apostle any longer. Paul was. So in that sense, he was unique. But his salvation was ultimately just like yours and just like mine. You say, how is that? Well, let's talk about salvation. Salvation is like, it's like a diamond, right? It's multifaceted. There are many ways that we could talk about salvation. But it, at its core, salvation consists of two events. I'm going to call them events. You can call them whatever you want to. But two events, regeneration and conversion. Y'all, I want you to listen to this. This is Theology 101 today, but we need to hear this. Salvation consists of regeneration and Conversion. What is regeneration? Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit whereby a person is made alive spiritually. I've already said this. We're born in sin, right? We're born separated from God. We are not born with the ability or the desire to run after God. That's just not who we are. We're not looking to please God. We're not looking to serve God. We are separated from God. 
We have no desire whatsoever to truly love God or live for Him. Uh, our motivations are, are turned in on ourselves. In short, regeneration is God's initiation of a change to our nature, to our very nature. Recall John 3. Jesus was having like a, a somewhat covert conversation with one of the rulers of Israel named Nicodemus. Nicodemus has come to Jesus. He's like, he's really in a quandary. He's going, hey, there's something unique about you. There's something different about you. I don't quite understand it. What is it? And Jesus says to Nicodemus these words, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Y'all, regeneration is, is the same thing as being born again. The word means to be born again. It also means to be born from above. It's monergistic. What I mean by that, it, one person is doing the work and that work is not you. It is God. It's a change in our spiritual status from being dead to life. And when Jesus here talks to Nicodemus, I want you to understand this. He says, we all have to be born again. And do you know, he speaks in the passive voice. How many of us here today had anything to do with the day that our mama gave birth to us? Any of you weigh in on that? You had nothing to do with it. Zero. The same thing is true about being born again. Y'all, and please, I'm, I'm not making fun of anybody because I mean, I, I once was there. But here's the deal. You don't come forward after a worship service and get born again. That is not a decision that is ours to make. We're dead in sin until the Holy Spirit comes to you and, and breathes spiritual life into you, changes your, your stony heart to a fleshly heart. You have no desire or no ability or motivated purely to follow after God. You say, that just doesn't seem right. I'm telling you, you know why it doesn't seem right? Because then that forces us to go, whoa, who, who, who am I? I mean, I thought I had something to do with it. No, when we, come, when we really understand, God has to come to me first. We're not conceited. We're not big-headed. We go out of there going, praise God from whom all blessings flow. We should walk out of there by just going, God, who am I? Why would you come to me and breathe life into me? So salvation is consists of regeneration or being born again. And second of all, then after regeneration comes conversion. Conversion. Conversion is the exercise of that new nature that God has given us to repentance and faith towards God. You got that. So you're, 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 you're dead in your sin and trespassing. You're not running after God whatsoever. But God comes to you, breathes into you spiritual life so that now you understand, you want to know God. And y'all, this doesn't mean it's a matter of days. It can be like a matter of nanoseconds between regeneration and conversion. You follow me there. But then after that, we understand well, what is conversion. Re conversion is made up of two parts, repentance and faith. Repentance towards my sin. I understand, wow, I'm a sinner. And, I, and, I, and I, when I start understanding the holiness of God and His demands and, and how my sin is an affront to a holy God, and I begin to mourn my sin, that's part of what repentance is, is, is mourning my sin, is understanding, is taking stock of who I really am and what my motives are like and what my heart is really like. And I, and I cry out to God, God, I'm sorry. But it's not just being sorry, right? You know, when your kids get caught with their hands in the cookie jar, they go, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. No, they're sorry because they got caught. This is another kind of sorrow. This is kind of sorrow that's going, God, I'm sorry that I've failed you. I'm breaking your heart. That's repentance. You turn away from yourself, 100 degree turn, and you turn by faith to Christ. So you got that so far. There's regeneration. God gives me a new heart. And then I am compelled to repent. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from myself. And then by faith, I turn to Jesus Christ. What is faith? 
Faith is understanding the gospel facts. It's believing that they are true. And it's putting total trust in those facts that you just heard. What are the facts? The facts are that we're sinners separated from a holy God. That without God's forgiveness, I'm going to die and I'm on my way to a devil's hell. I know that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't float well with our culture anymore, does it? To talk about hell, to talk about God's judgment, things like that. It just doesn't fit well with our culture. But we believe the facts, we hear the facts, we believe that they're true, we believe that God sent His Son, His one and only Son, who is God in the flesh, who has always existed. Never a time that the Lord Jesus didn't exist. He becomes man, He takes on flesh, He lives a perfect life. He keeps all of God's law, and not only that, He goes to the cross. And He's killed on the cross. Listen, He's not killed ultimately by Roman soldiers. He's offered on the cross by His Father. His own father sends his own son to death. The Bible says that whosoever will believe in him would never perish but have everlasting life. So I know the facts of the gospel. I I believe that they're true that Jesus lived a perfect life and that he died and was buried and rose again. But listen, it's not enough just to believe all that. The Bible says the devils believe all that stuff, right? Devils believe that so far. So what's what's left? The left is putting trust. It's not just believing it, but it's taking your, your whole life and laying it at the feet of Jesus and saying, Jesus, I belong to you. You are mine. I will follow you forever. We don't necessarily see in this text today, in, in Acts chapter 9, all of this flowing just perfectly in this account of Paul's conversion. But trust God. Trust God's word, what Paul says in his writings, that these things did happen to him. But I want you to notice this. Notice the sequence of what goes on. A person is dead in his or her sin. He is regenerated or she is regenerated by the Holy Spirit. In other words, born again. And only after a person is born again is he or she converted. And by conversion, it means to repent and put faith in Jesus Christ. You got that? That's salvation. Salvation is regeneration and conversion. After that, what happens to Paul? He's baptized. He's baptized. As you are well aware, Cassandra is being baptized today. Well, what's that all about? What's what's baptism really mean? Is it important? Well, certainly don't have time today and don't, don't intend on going in depth today on, on what baptism is or isn't. But let me just quickly tell you what baptism is not. Baptism is not jumping in the pool and washing your sins away. It doesn't work that way. You say, why? Well, if my sins are washed away simply by something I do, then it's me that gets credit for salvation. And ultimately then, that salvation is by works. Jumping into the pool and getting washed, washing away my sin. No, that's not what baptism is. What is baptism? Let me just quickly go over a few things. Number one, it's a picture. It's a picture of Christ's work by dying on a cross and being buried and then being raised from the dead. Cassandra, when you follow the Lord today in believers' baptism, that's what you are showing this congregation. And in essence, you are showing the world that you believe this, that you believe Jesus came and died on the cross for your sin, that he was buried and that he rose again. Um, That's what we say when we're being baptized. What else is? It's a picture of our union with Christ, that our old self has died with Christ, Our old self was buried and our old self has been raised to the newness of life with Christ. What else is it? It's a public profession of faith. Again, you'll be saying to the world when you are baptized today, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So, in a sense, it becomes an initial step of obedience 
person that comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, they know, well, what's the very first thing I need to do to obey Jesus? It's to be baptized scripturally. It's the initiation rite into the new covenant, so to speak. And so we see then that the Lord's Supper would be a continuation rite, only meant for those who have entered into the covenant through baptism. And y'all don't miss this. God is the main player during a baptismal service. Right? I mean, we're gonna, we will see Cassandra in her white robe, and by a white robe, we're reminded that in Christ, we're all given those white robes. The book of Revelation makes that very plain. But y'all, as you see her baptized, the Holy Spirit is moving in this congregation, doing many things, but one of the primary ways the Holy Spirit is moving is by saying, remember your baptism? Remember how you were lost and you were dead to sin and Christ came to you and you have died to yourself and to your sin and you've been buried and you've been raised again? So these are the first two takes. Two stages of the Christian life. Pre-conversion, and then there's salvation, which is regeneration and conversion. But finally, let's look at the third stage of the Christian life. I'm just calling today living quorum Deo. Stage three in the believer's life, living quorum Deo. Look at what uh, the Bible says as it continues in chapter 9 of Acts. He's speaking of Paul and taking food. He was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of all those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Y'all, if all we were, if all God wanted in our, in our life is when he, he comes to us and changes us and we're saved, if all He wanted to do is just save us and get us to heaven, why didn't He just take us to heaven right then? But there's a purpose we remain on this earth. And that purpose is that through the, the life that we live and the trials that we experience and all those kind of things, God is making us more like Christ. So what happens in Paul? He goes and spends time with the saints. You see that? Immediately he goes and he spends time with the saints. Y'all, there's no such thing in Christianity, in the Christian church... As Christian Lone Rangers. Many of you are too young to even remember the Lone Ranger. But the whole idea is out doing something on your own. There's no such thing as that. When we're saved, we gain a new family. That's how we learn. That's where we're nurtured. And I'm sorry, y'all. This, this is just the way it is. You're not nurtured by watching preaching on TV or streaming it on YouTube. Those, are good, those can be good tools when I can't be with the body. We, we understand that, that, right? But those are no substitutes for being together with the body of Christ. Having access to sermons on the internet can be very, very useful. But it is not an excuse to stay home in your pajamas and drink coffee and just say, well, I'm just going to stay home today and watch it. Do you think the early church would have done that? They yearned. They needed. They craved. Their lives were dependent on this interconnectivity with each other. And then the Bible says that Paul immediately, I mean immediately, not a year later after seminary or something, he says immediately he began proclaiming Christ in the synagogues. You talk about a 180 degree turn. So then, what is this third stage of the Christian life? What is this quorum deo? The word quorum deo just simply means the face of God. It means living in the presence of God moment to moment to moment. That I am decided to live my life in the presence of God. So as a kernel of corn 
is dead and is buried and it begins to take on life. And as it takes on life, it stretches out to the sun. And as it stretches to the sun, it, it bears fruit. So you and I, as believers, we're dead to our sins and trespasses. But through Christ, we've been buried and we've been made alive. And now we are raised, and as we grow, we reach our hearts to the Son. And as we grow and mature in the Son, we bear fruit. We're not told here that we're to be like the Apostle Paul as he was an apostle. There are no more apostles. I'm sorry, they're not. So if you go to a church and they call themselves the apostle, that's a wrong standing. If you're around a church or you're reading or you're influenced by the new apostolic reformation, get away from it. Flee. Run away. I don't care how many people are in that church or how cool the music is. It's wrong. We're not called to write scripture. Paul wrote scripture. But nevertheless, Paul was able to say, listen, imitate me. He said that on several occasions. Follow me. Do what I do. Act like I do. Why? When you're following me, I'm imitating Christ. Well, what would he say? How, how would he live for Christ? Paul would say this. I count everything as, you know the word, what? Loss. I count everything on this earth that I have as loss. I'll, I'll throw everything away and exchange it for the excellence of knowing Christ. He would cry out, oh, that I might know Him. And he would say this, and the power of His resurrection. How many of us want to know the power of Christ's resurrection? Whatever that means, it sounds good. I, I want to know the power of His resurrection. But Paul adds... And the fellowship of his suffering. Don't believe the lie that trusting Christ means now God is somehow indebted to you to make you healthy and wealthy. The Bible never says that. In fact, we know that by saying yes to Christ... It's more the norm than the exception that we will suffer persecution, have very little, and live miserable lives on this planet. So, I'm about to close this message. I want, I want you, but if you've been asleep or you hadn't listened or you just had a hard time so far and you can't process any of the stuff I've said, I want you to process this. Okay? Sit up and lean into this. What, is, what does living quorum Deo really mean for me and for you? Here's the way I'll say it. If you're, you're a believer in Christ, God has changed you. You're saved, right? You're saved. God looks at you now as completely righteous. You say, that can't be. Well, I know, but he does. Do y'all understand this? I won't even flesh this out. I'm going to say something right here, and I want you to go home and think about it. Okay? I want you to go home and think about this. Christ died for Christians too. Now process that and think about that a little bit. Christ died for Christians too. But listen, if you are a believer, the way God sees you, He sees you clothed in His Son's righteousness. On your, on, on, in your account, when you put your trust in Christ, God took Christ's righteousness like a garment, like a white robe and clothe you in it so that now every time he looks at you he sees you through the righteousness of his dear son y'all that should make Baptists almost stand up and shout it, it means this it means this you mean he still sees me as holy and righteous when I just thought some awful thought yes yes you mean he still counts me as righteous when I've sinned against him in, in, in an aberrant kind of way? Yes, yes, that's the gospel. Jesus died for Christians too. So that's how God sees That's who we are, y'all. We should rejoice. Take that burden away that I've got to somehow earn favor with God. 
He sees us as righteous. But, but listen, do you feel righteous all the time? Do you live righteously all the time? We would be quick to say no. So living quorum deem, deem means this. If, if, if positionally I am with Christ in heaven, Ephesians tells us that, we are in the heavenlies with God in Christ. That's where we are positionally. I'm in heaven. God loves me. I'm righteous. Experientially, not so much. So sanctification What God is doing while I'm on this earth and what I'm to give my every breath to doing and being is I want to do all that I can in the power of the Holy Spirit, listen, to become who I already am. You get that? That's what I'm striving for. I want to become who I already am. Fight like crazy to become who you already are. Cassandra, all eyes are on you now. Do you, you know that? I mean, not, not just here, what I'm saying, the world out here, even some of your family who doesn't know Christ, People are going to look at you now because you have, you have expre- you've stood up and said, Jesus is the only way and I've given my life to Him. And not just her, but we all did that. And they're all watching us. And God help us that we not drag that white, precious robe of Christ's righteousness through the mud in our lives. You have a special and high charge now to take forth the name of Jesus, as do we all who call ourselves Christians. Chances are there's someone in this room right now who's not a believer. On the outside, you might look like a religious person, or even on the outside, you're not. But y'all, God sees our heart. And one day, one day we'll all stand before those piercing eyes of a holy God. And you know what? We won't be able to fake it on that day. So I'll leave you with this as we move towards this baptism. If if you're going, preacher, um, man, I I really want to know more about what you just said or I've got some questions or whatever. As soon as we're done with this baptism... I'm going to be in the room across the hall. I'd love to pray with you or talk with you or answer any questions that I can with you. But church, as we're gathered now for this baptism, I want to encourage you to rejoice with Cassandra. But more than that, this is not about her per se. It's about Christ in her and in us. So rejoice. And I'm going to ask you to reflect on your own baptism as she's baptized today as well. Okay. Well, let's, um, we're going to sing and we'll make our way up to the baptistry. And thank you for your attention this day.